<sighs> well, I guess while he's gone, um, I'm going to take this time to say that I really appreciate everyone putting up with co-host for um, this first year. Um, you know, I mean, you remember back in the first episode where he fucking forgot that he didn't have internet yet, so he had to do it on his phone? You know how shitty that fucking sounded? Ugh. And, you know, he's just not funny. He's not entertaining. He kind of sucks. But uh, he's very supportive. And, you know, as you guys know, he does do the social media stuff. So, you know, I'm but I promise you this next year, we're going to have a more diverse array of co-hosting duties. With many, many interesting people, I promise you. And, um, you know, you will probably still see co-host every now and then he might even be like a, a smaller part of the show. Um, you know, we'll, um, we'll have to change his name from co-host to like, uh, special guest, maybe, you know, just something, something to make him feel good that even though he's not doing fucking anything, but he doesn't do anything now either, you know? So, uh, anyway, yeah, um, yeah, this guy sucks. You should get rid of him. <laughs> He sounds awful. In the first aeon, I was the great spirit. In the second aeon, the Nimi is the horned god, pan genital, pan phage. In the third aeon, I was the dark one, the devil. In the fourth aeon, the men knew me not, for I was the hidden one. In the fifth aeon, I appeared before you as baphomet. The god before all gods who shall persist to the end of the earth. In this new era, I come to you as C M N. Imagine that there is a brilliant white light just above. Is commentary on the magic art in the year of the final form. Oh, that was very educational. Now magic will take place. Don't be fooled by what I just said. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I'm Somewhat Meaningful Kennedy, and this is Chaos Magic News, the only podcast that's very thankful for all of our listeners. Yeah, those other podcasts don't care about you. No, no, they don't. They, they hate you, in fact. Yeah. You know, Pod Save America said said they fucking hated all of you. Seriously. And they said something about your mother that I'm not going to repeat. They don't appreciate you like we do. <laughs> I don't even know what Pod Save America is. Like that I feel like that was that's just a name that I have. So I had to like I wasn't gonna say anyone thought, that I like. I thought you made that up. <laughs> is that a real thing? Is Pod yeah, Save America? I've heard that I've heard that name. I've never listened to it before. Joining me as always is my um yearly co-host and iversary. H- how you doing, co-host? I'm not doing this game today. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm doing pretty good. I mean, that this is this is Y'all know what it, this it's, is. It, yeah. It's this is a big moment for us, I suppose. You know, it's like it doesn't feel like a oh my god, you know, you you hit the powerball and got Mr. Beast level subscribers or anything like that. But you know, we've, we've hit the, we've hit the year mark, you know, 28 episodes down the tubes. Yeah. And, yeah 28 yeah. episodes and a whole year later. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where we're at, you know? And I guess the, the biggest thing that you'll probably hear us say, and we probably don't say it enough is just how much we appreciate all of you listeners and, all the great people in the discord who, you know, they, they know everybody in the discord knows that we love them because we tell them constantly. Yeah. And if but, you, you know, you who is not in the discord were over there, we, we tell you how much we love you there too. Yeah. We'd give you a little, we'd give you a little kiss on the forehead, you know, yeah, you know, a little, little, little smoochy smooch. Uh, but yeah, we, we we're, we're just blown away by the amount of support and love that people have been showing us, whether it's on the socials, whether it's going in the discord or just listening to it, you know, it's a, 
it's amazing, and we are looking forward to doing more for you guys in the future. We've got plans, and like we talked a couple episodes back about uh, working on some some sort of open magic projects that people can look at, and then I know that there's the idea about like how what we're going to do for Patreon and how we're going to create you know member exclusive content stuff like that. But we don't have anything laid in stone yet, but knowing that there's actually a market for this and that you there are people who would be interested is just blowing us away. Yeah, it's truly humbling. When we started this, I don't think we thought it through. <laughs> like no. Like, like like legitimately, I don't think we really thought about like we didn't start it with the intention of oh yeah, we're going to have like a bunch of people listening and we're going to have a lot of people that hang out in our a discord and we talk with them and we talk about magic and we make jokes and we have watch parties and we, you know, um, have them. They're now people that show up on the podcast and we talk about them in the podcast and we have people that actually want to listen to this. We have people that see our clips on TikTok and on Instagram and stuff like that. And they laugh and they think the stuff's funny. And, and even you people that don't know about the fucking podcast, which I don't imagine how you could possibly not know about the podcast. We shill it all the time. But all the people on the meme page stuff that like our stuff and are helping spread it along even in their own way. Like we didn't set out with any real goal other than just wanting to do a podcast and do something where we could share our thoughts and hopefully bring a different kind of perspective to chaos magic and you know to a lesser extent i guess the world but that's there's so many of you that actually like this is truly truly humbling and we can't thank you enough and like coho said we have plans for the future and we're very thankful that you'll be here for it that is the most sincere we've been on this podcast, and it's really making me uncomfortable. Can we please make a joke about like someone falling down some stairs? <laughs> that really is where we're at. Where it's, it when you when we stop and think about it, you do get a little, you know, you're not like choked up emotional or anything, but it is sort of it is humbling and it is. A I little, mean, I am like, a little bit, honestly. Wow, but it it is that feeling of like wow, people people genuinely want to hear this. You know, yeah. and and like you said, I the idea of we were starting this because we were just sick of what we were getting from the occult community, particularly online occult community. We just wanted to do anything else. And we were like, all right, let's just do a podcast. And now we have the one thing that we were trying to get away from, which is a occult community. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we we rub elbows with other people that are in in the world of uh spooky nonsense and we have uh we have people that are fans of our work and we have people that are that have become genuine friends because of this and so what we learned is if you really don't like the online occult community start a podcast and then people will agree with you <laughs> well i guess maybe it, there's a there's an old joke where it's like the 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 greatest honor that you can ever get from any occult group is to be thrown out and told to start your own thing. <laughs> and I guess that's where we're at. You know, it's like, we just, you know. what, have, what have we learned in a year of doing this? You think, I don't know. I like listening back to the earlier episodes, you can tell that we're not quite as comfortable or at the very least, we don't realize how we're going to come across on these diatribes. So I think we've gotten a little bit smoother, not in like a, a super suave way, but I guess in the way of, we know how to avoid dead air we our ums and ahs have gotten a little bit better we don't i've gotten a lot better blabber. about editing them out too yeah and that's another thing too is your your editing jobs have probably gotten a little bit better or a lot a bit better i think that it's interesting to see that there are certain opinions that we've expressed earlier on that we no longer stand by and it hasn't even been that long I, but that, that's that always... not shocking. I, I've changed opinions from one week to the next. In fact, I I I remember listening to episodes while I'm editing, going, I I don't know. I, Why I, did I, I say I, that? Yeah, I said that wrong. Yeah, that's true. You're not obligated to be the same person you were yesterday or even a minute from now. So 
I, I guess we've got that down. What else have we learned? I think it's really interesting to see how in the beginning we're really focused on trying to keep things relative to the occult. But at the same time, you can tell we're struggling. And but when we give up on it is when we just really take off as a show, I think. Right at the beginning of the new year was the Cult of Saturn episode. And that is the first real episode of the show in my mind. <laughs> Two hours. So? That's like an hour of it is us talking about the most off the wall thing we could come up with. That's still a related to the occult. <laughs> I think that's really where the show comes off. And it's, it's interesting to note too, that um a lot of the running jokes of the show in the discord come in like that episode and then the next couple because right after that i think is dragon pilled yeah right after that so like dragon pilled happens and we haven't we haven't done nearly enough <laughs> as far as uh dragon pilled content i still want to know who the hell wrote that god i, still I have find like, yeah i have looked and i can't find them i can only Im imagine that the cosmic black dragon or whatever the fuck that shit was manifested itself into a PDF and then just put itself on my phone, knowing that I yeah, was the most dragon pilled magician they were going to find. Uh, only explanation. I do definitely think that the show starts to come into its own. I mean, and that's, that's every podcast though. It's like, you're going to hit a point where it's like, no, this is really what the show is trying to be. And I think that, and this will, this will make it sound bad, but the less of a fuck that we gave, about coming across like we're uh like we we know what we're talking about the better the show has gotten oh yeah yeah I, <laughs> you know that's where it's exactly like, what i think when it went when it became that like hey man there's this old internet rabbit hole about a a cult that probably doesn't even really exist do you want to you want to talk about it and it's like hell yeah and then a couple episodes later it's like Hey, uh, you want to just do a thing where we read internet creepypastas for a minute and talk about how awful magic they are? And it's like, these are not highbrow content. <laughs> these are not, uh, these are not quality assessments of, uh, of occultism, but they, they work really well for us because it gives us stuff to laugh at and it's stuff that can be entertaining and, and it can, like, and they can always open the door. And I think that's how our show works is that we're here to entertain people and just sort of be goofy and talk like that. And then occasionally or even accidentally will be insightful or present you with something interesting. Well, you know what Which the is funny good. thing about this show is, is a lot of the times we have topics that we go into with the opening topic kind of conversations where we try to get our highbrow seriousness out and it's good because we can talk seriously we can throw some jokes in there along the way and then we get to the news where we get to just let loose and you know we do the news on autopilot oh, yeah. at this point we just pull the headlines up and go oh fuck and just watch as the words fly out like fucking gold eggs out of a goose <laughs> but I think some of our most insightful moments have come from trying to give like a cult insight into those weird things like, you know, like the cult of Saturn, like the episode where you remember there's an episode where we spend the entire last half of the show essentially reading someone's critique of a political ideology and the entire point of it was just so we could not talk about whether or not the chaos star was gonna get appropriated by a fascist yeah yeah that's like true. that's it's yeah. just a it was a it was a ludicrous thing to do but it's it's it was not only entertaining and funny but it was also you know it, it was insightful we talked about a lot of things that i can't imagine ever being able to talk about on another podcast like those other podcasts that don't care about you the way that we do listen baby you know we love you those it sounds like those other podcasts just don't really love you <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, um yeah and and if you if you, you're sticking around still as we sit here and jerk ourselves off about <laughs> <laughs> our marginally successful podcast, then God bless you, man. God bless you. <laughs> this episode is without a doubt going to be self-indulgent and if not self-congratulatory or self-masturbatory, definitely uh, this is an episode that is 
in some small way a a victory lap for a show that we didn't think was going to last half this long. Yeah. But as long as we're enjoying it, I'm sure that we're going to keep doing it. And this has stayed fresh enough that I haven't gotten bored with it. And I'm, I'm excited to keep growing. And on that note, one last time, everybody who has helped us get this far, we thank you. Yeah, every single one of you. You guys are the absolute best. There are so many people that did things that they really didn't have to do to help us out. And we... People who went out of their way. People who had our backs when nobody should have cared. Yeah. And as we continue to burn our respectability and shred our credibility, we just want you to know that we're going to need you now more than ever. <laughs> Look, when they, when they are indicting us, you got to promise not to be flipping. <laughs> look, look, all I'm saying is that eventually we will get big and then people will look at these very early episodes and they're going to let us have it. <laughs> yeah, they're going yeah, they're, they're to have it. What's been your favorite episode of the show so far? Oh, man. For, for whatever reason, right? I think I, I always go back to the very first uh, bargain bin five ah, be- no, as yeah. above, five below, the astrology dice episode. Uh, astrology dice. I find that one very, like, exceedingly amusing. I, like, I, I think that's the one where we start off where we talk about how much we drink while we're on the podcast. <laughs> and then, like, I think that's also where the, the CMN is the strawberry which is like I, oh, I still, yeah. I, I, I still say that to myself every once in a while. It's like CMN's the strawberry, and the the tigers are the two people or, or the two guys you don't like. <laughs> um, but yeah, then the astrology dice thing, where it's like I wish I had had more to say about them because they're still just the funniest fucking thing. But don't worry, just one, not a whole one lot day to... we'll one day we'll find something goofy to do with them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what what about you? Um. I have two answers. I, I I think my favorite one to make was probably the um the Bobby Hemet episode. Mm-hmm. Just because like it was so it was so much fun to do that and just be completely lost in the sauce on Bobby Hemet having this, yeah. you know, because because we didn't go the only idea we went into that with is Bobby Hemet is super ridiculous and entertaining and people should know about him. And we turned it into a kind of like a slow burn of being like, you know, Bobby Hemet's pretty great to the point where it's like, no, Bobby Hemet is like absolutely bonkers, but there's yeah. a lesson yeah. to be heard. That, so I, I feel like that one, that was one of the most organic and interesting episodes. And of course it's got such classics as make it slip, sip malt liquor simple for you and you got 72 you got motherfuckers, 72 in, your motherfuckers in your brain yeah. yeah and you know the black yeah, god that's... soot and the blue black god krishna self-begotten set typhon yeah yeah you know it's like all those classics that <laughs> yeah. we in our day-to-day lives just say to each other yeah yeah i think my favorite to edit was the uh the castaneda special really yeah that was... i feel like Oddly enough, right? Because, you know, it's only the second special and we, you know, we're, don't worry, folks. We already got the next one planned. You're going to be super pumped for it. We're not going to spoil it yet. But the, the first special is really interesting in its own right because it's the first time we did it and we got to do a deep dive. You know, again, I got to read a bunch of Kenneth Grant, which is always a fun time. We got to talk about Lovecraft. We got to make jokes. But I feel like the Carlos Castaneda special was m- maybe us at our best. That that might have that might be the quintessential CMN kind of episode. Of course, it doesn't have a news bit, so it doesn't it can't really be the quintessential. But as far as like the balance of I mean, maybe it's just because Carlos Castaneda himself is so easy to fucking just make all the jokes in the world about. It's such a weird situation. There's so many weird things going on there that it's just um it's so it's like, again, we could do a whole nother Carlos Castaneda special probably. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And he's, he has that certain level of familiarity mm-hmm. and that ubiquitousness of much like Crowley. There's so much of Castaneda that is just bled out into other things. Right. Right. Yeah. 
we were able to get to the gems in a lot of this. And then we were also able to, to laugh about a lot of the not gems. And I think it creates a good balance. I think that both of the specials we've done so far are really good. I'm looking forward to the next one, which is, you know, that's two episodes from now. Yeah, it is. Now you make a good point though. As far as my favorite episode to make rather than like my favorite episode to like that, the one that I've gotten the most laughs out of listening. My favorite one is actually pretty easy. (laughs) air horn air horn air horn air horn (laughs) yeah oh jesus yep there you go (laughs) thank you everyone we would not be here without you now to show our appreciation for our fans here are some things that all of our lovely lovely people in the discord sent us so we're going to, from here on, be cutting periodically to uh, little things that they recorded for us, like this one. What's up, Chaos Magic News, a.k.a. CMN, a.k.a. Seaman. Congratulations on writing out one full year, you jizzlobbers. May you have many more years of putting out episodes I promise I'll get around to listening to, really. Well, wow, wasn't that great? Say are, something. Are you asking? Are you asking yeah. me? Like, no, like, it was it was oh. rhetorical. I'm just saying that the thing the the listener sent us was good. Was it? I <laughs> yes, I haven't t- heard it yet because n- you didn't edit it. In. You, <laughs> I'm replying to something that I haven't listened to yet. Just pretend. Just pretend and show your appreciation for the things that they sent us. Oh, like a weenie. Thank you. I appreciate it. Can we do the news now? Oh, man, I've been waiting for this. I think you should do it this time. You haven't done it once since we've started. We're our whole year in, and not once have you asked. Um, what's in the... That was terrible. <laughs> no, God. No, 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 no. Uh, Try it again. God damn it. Okay, hang on. What's in the news? How is that? What is in the news indeed? That was fantastic. Uh, you really, I, you convinced me. Awesome. Let's never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What have, what have you got for us this time? Fuck, what else is there to talk about other than Israel and Palestine? Mm, good point. Do you have any horrible, controversial takes that would get you silenced by the mainstream media? Ugh, everything. Just. <laughs> God. You know what talking about this in the Discord more than anything has shown me? That what? there's no, like, there's no real good take to have. Because everyone I've talked to, I feel like we're all just circling around the fact that the only thing any of us can say is that it is horrible that innocent people are dying and I don't have a solution. And I think that's what everyone is doing and no one wants to admit it. Correction. The only people that aren't doing that are people that are very convinced that the solution is killing all of X group. It's like, look, yeah, that's, I have, that, that sums yeah. it up. I have very strong opinions about Israel. I said when this happened that, let's be honest, Israel shouldn't have existed, but it's a little late now. Right, right, right. In situations like this, the people that suffer are innocent civilians. There are people in the Gaza Strip who have been mistreated and oppressed. It's a delicate issue to talk about. So it's like people in the... There are people in the Gaza Strip that are getting fucking boned, you know, doing like literal human atrocities being committed on them. But Hamas are a bunch of maniacs, you know? These are not <laughs> these are not people that you want to get control of that region. You don't want you do not want that. Like if if you think that things are going to get better, I mean there's and then the fact is it's like what? If if Israel falls, you're going to see mass casualties of the Jewish population. And that's going to be fucking abhorrent as well. It's like, these are two sides that seem mostly like no one's going to be happy until 
the other side has been completely obliterated. Right. That's that's the problem, because there's no way out of this that doesn't result in somebody being genocided. And yeah, that's a and horrifying it's... thing to have to reckon with, especially with how complicit the West has been in this situation. Well, and the biggest issue is that the West as a whole. Well, I mean, it's the they United don't actually States. Give a Let's da- just be they, honest. Yeah, well, yeah. United, yeah, fine. The United States. The United States doesn't really give a shit about Israel. They want a strategic foothold in the Middle East. Right. If anybody else could stand us, we would have better options. <laughs> But instead, we're willing to pump up, we're willing to pump everything we can into Israel because it's kind of our only buddy in that area. And yeah. it has nothing to do with, it, it genuinely, it doesn't have anything to do with, me, with a, a, pro, uh, a pro-Zionist stance or anything like that or, or a, a, a belief in Israel's legitimacy. It's purely a strategic maneuver. And anyone else who tells you that, they're either drinking their own Kool-Aid or they're lying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's a handful of people that are incredibly religious and have all sorts of ideas, but we're talking about why the oh, U.S. Oh, well, they think that... Yeah. Well, they, well there's also... Those are the ones that, that stop the like, UFOs. Yeah, exactly. They think that Israel... They, they think that Israel existing is uh, going to usher in the, the Armageddon, you know, so that Jesus can come back. Those people are unhinged and... But they're Hold not real nearly positions as... positions of power. <sighs> Not nearly as many of them as you would think. No. So, but, but that's yeah. the problem. It's like, you don't want to just, you don't want to, <laughs> that's what makes it such a hard thing where it's like, I don't have any love for Hamas, but I'm also not going to pretend that Israel hasn't committed horrible <laughs> human rights violations against the, against the Palestinians. Uh, it, yeah, it's I fucked. just know the whole that there's several fucked. people just rolling their eyes and saying that we're bitch made for not being like, Oh, I know who deserves to be obliterated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are people, there are people listening right now who have all of the correct opinions and you should, you should know that we think you're so right yeah, about you're so what smart. humans should be bombed to shit so that they're, they are dead forever. You know, that, you you have seen through the bullshit and decided that you that these are the appropriate people to kill to solve problems and we commend you you're so much smarter than us you're out of the matrix you your third eye yeah. is open yep yep uh so that's my that's my two cents um i don't want to get into too many specifics but i i will say that it, it's great because we do have all of these people who have very strong opinions on who are the correct ones to kill. And you get to see propaganda coming at you from every direction so that you are on board with mass casualties. <laughs> and if you don't agree with that, then you're the bad guy. Yep. How dare you not want to kill people? Yep. How dare you? How dare you? We just want to obliterate people to make the world a better place. Remember, the solution to all the problems is just to kill enough of, the, of X amount of people or X amount of people of X group. Well, at least over on our own country, things are going good, right? No? I think, I think as it stands right now, you have a better chance of winning. Amer- it's American Idol even still a thing. It is, right? Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't watched television in many years now. You have a better chance of scrounging up enough votes to win American Idol than you do to be House Speaker. <laughs> Yeah. That's a fucking um, Jimmy Fallon. That's a late night show. Jimmy. That is. <laughs> like, that's what that level was. Yeah. But for real, like, there's, it just seems like they keep bringing these votes and people are like, so, I, I swear, it's like these, the, the number of votes that everyone all around is getting gets lower every single time. Oh, God. I just uh, love the, how uh, Gates and like the eight people that voted out fucking um, McCarthy like released a statement thing going like, please just vote for Jim Jordan. We'll take whatever spanking you want to give us for being bad. Just come on, be a team player now. And then it like it like an hour or two later, it was like Jim Jordan fucking drop. It's like an hour later, Jim Jordan dropped his uh, nominee. And then them yeah. scrambling to figure out who else they could get. Did you hear someone floated uh, George W. Bush? Yeah, people have said Donald Trump and George W. Bush and this, that, and the third. 
all of these people that you could possibly think, and you, you listener, have been chosen to be the Speaker <laughs> of the House. You just got to get enough votes. Right now, I'm thinking Howard the Duck would make a great option. <laughs> Someone should like do one of those memes where it's like, you know, someone holding a piece of paper with it's like, it says, if I can get 1 million shares or 1 million likes, I get to be house speaker. Please share this with friends and family so I can become house speaker. It's just, it's, uh, it's just, and it's great because this is literally holding up everything else. And we've got the debt ceiling thing that's going to be here in a number of weeks. So it, it's just shaping up to be a perfect storm of, of just a representative democracy just grinding to a fucking halt because we've become so partisan that we, we are not willing to give anybody an inch on shit. But I do have to applaud the Republican Party for showing that the right can also fight each other and not get anything accomplished. <laughs> Uh, this is what happens when you got two parties that agree on like a bunch of things. So they got to pretend that they disagree on the other things even harder. Oh, guess so. Uh, guess so. What's up? You guys ready for your addendum? As you already know, Mike Johnson, nobody congressman from Louisiana got elected. He's a nobody. He sucks. Um, He's very boring looking. I don't have many jokes I can make about him. There's not really anything to talk about here other than they managed to get somebody whoop the fucking do. <laughs> this isn't even really headline worthy, but I want to say this is from RT. You know, uh, what, what was the what was the RT mm -hmm. joke? Me? Yeah, you used to call you called RT Russian Twitter. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did do that. <laughs> Russian I forgot about the yeah. Russian. The, the, the problem was is that I no. The problem is I legit thought that that was what it stood for. for <laughs> <laughs> it was a Russian Twitter, right? <laughs> um, Nikki Haley said the department. <laughs> Nikki Haley said the U.S. needs Department of Offense, not Defense. Isn't that like the fucking stupidest thing that has come out of a presidential candidate's mouth in a long time? Like, let's be honest, um, that, cause that's, that's not Joe Biden more... brain falling out of his mouth. Stupid. That's not like Donald Trump being like, shut up fat. <laughs> <laughs> like that is someone trying to sound cool or trying to sound intelligent. Like they're making a real point here. It's just, it, it, that is, that is a brain dead comment. That is like dead from the neck up type shit where it's that's like, we like, need to print to off. <laughs> that's the, that's the you are, presidential equivalent of that guy being like, check it out. You realize like when you realize it's through real eyes, eyes. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's well, that's well. And the problem is, is that when you actually analyze what they're, what that person is like, the implication of that is some more is like some of the most war hawkish shit that has ever come out of a politician's mouth in a minute where it's like, we don't need a department of defense. We need a department that's going to go over and start fucking wars. <laughs> Why would you want that? Why the fuck would you want that? Maybe she went, meant like part department of offense. Like I take offense to that. Well, uh, so she, it may, why, maybe she's like, oh, all these snowflakes. I guess we need a department of offense. <laughs> So you can be offended that, when I, I bomb other if, countries. If that's what it was, that would be, that would be even more brain dead. Like <laughs> that, that is, that's far more brain dead than what we were initially discussing. God, what else do we have? There really isn't more news that there's like, there's really not news that isn't like Israel or the speaker or, Oh, just one more stupid buzz by headline, but I just, cause I bet, I think this is an opinion piece actually, but just the title made me have to say this. I, I need to say this sentence out loud. So someone else knows this is real toxic Netanyahu could drag Biden down in his fight for political survival. Like that's the word we're using for Netanyahu is he's, he's toxic. Like, no, no, your, <laughs> your ex-boyfriend was toxic. Netanyahu is evil. <laughs> Oh, hey, that's something. What? Did you hear about MS Paint getting layers? Like uh like like Photoshop type stuff? Yeah, yeah. They updated MS Paint to give it layers of all fucking things. I hate that. I like I like 
I want shitty MS Paint drawings. That's the whole the the point of MS Paint is to make bad drawings. <laughs> like it's supposed I, to be bad. I described it to someone I think is like if you were playing like old school Mario Kart 64 and then someone came up to you and said, "Hey, they have online play for that now." Yeah, it's just so Yeah, this far, is so far removed. Like yeah, this doesn't it, make any sense. This is such a jump over what it was. And it's like, no, this, this wasn't even supposed to do that. Uh, there's the goofy kid. You want to hear uh, the based and dragon? And this one is truly a based and dragon pilled headline. Okay, definitely. 76 year old pleads guilty to stealing Wizard of Oz ruby slippers. <laughs> the 76 year old man charged with stealing a pair of ruby slippers that were worn by Judy Garland on the film. Wizard of Oz changed his plea to guilty at the federal courthouse in Duluth on Friday morning. Terry John Martin said he believed the slippers were made of real rubies and then dumped them when he discovered that they were not. (laughs) Oh my God. Time out. (laughs) That's what gets it. (laughs) What do you mean they don't have actual rubies in them? (laughs) Oh my God. You, that you motherfucker just smash it. Holy you shit. break into a building with a sledgehammer, smash the case, and then you're like, well, these are fucking sequin. I guess, guess I better dump them. <laughs> you know, just like, how long? Hold on. My question is, how long did he examine these things before he came to that uh <laughs> that salient conclusion <laughs> that these are not precious gems? I, I where was he first, gonna fence these? <laughs> what was he gonna do? Was it how, who was he going to sell these to? Was he going to break them off, like break the rubies off one by one? Or that would look, I mean, that's going to look suspicious as hell. You walk into a pawn shop with like two, with a, with a Walmart bag. No, full no, of no. Rubies. You, you break them up one by one and you kind of sell them off. Like you sell like two or three here, three or four somewhere else. You spread them out. You don't know anything about fencing shit. I guess not, man. I guess not. Just I like this because I think you're completely right. Like this guy didn't think about this shit at all. He must have. He probably remembered the movie, right? And then he saw like where'd they get robbed from? The museum, right? Yeah, some sort of museum. Right. So oh yeah, he, yeah. And the the Judy the Judy Garland Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan, or oh, Grand okay. Rapids. No, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Apparently, there's a Grand there's, Grand Rapids, damn, Minnesota. I didn't. Well, know okay, was Grand place. Rapids is a pretty ge- generic name. I, I guess that makes sense. All it right. wasn't like Detroit, Minnesota. Anyway, but no, like this guy probably remembered the movie. He's like, ah, oh, them ruby slippers, and he he hadn't thought about it for fucking ever. He sees the Judy Garland Museum thing up. It's got a sign saying, "Now we have her her ruby slippers." He was like, uh huh, I'm gonna go get me some rubies. Like this, this wasn't like a, a guy who like went to the museum every day for years, looking at them slippers, he didn't, studying he didn't them, stake making them a out. plan. No. Yeah, no, no, no. He said, I've got a sledgehammer and I'm going to get me some, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get me some precious jewels. This is, this is the Judy Garland museum. This ain't the MoMA. No, it's also worth noting that they were on loan. So maybe he knew that they weren't going to be in town for very long. He's like, this is my right, only yeah. chance. He, he saw the he saw the advertisement. It said for this week only, Judy Garland slippers, Ruby. And he was like, I remember that he's... movie. Them made a solid gold. <laughs> he smashed them. He got away. He probably went to the pawn shop and said, they're solid Ruby, Jim. And he's like, buddy, like these are these are felt. And he's like, ah, oh, damn it. Just throw them away. That's how they got him back. D- I wonder if they, I, I didn't see anything in the article saying if they were recovered or not. Hopefully oh, they, they have, were, but. Oh, that would be even worse. Could you imagine they like, they catch you like, where are the slippers? And he's like, I mean, I threw them shits in the river. I threw that they bitch. I threw them bitches in sorry, the trash. Officer, I know, officer, I know you got to be disappointed too. They weren't real Ruby. <laughs> yeah, these were fake. I don't know where the real Ruby slippers went. <laughs> Do we oh, want to make shit. the obligatory joke of like, you know, it's actually, it's a shame that he threw them away because he was probably in that jail cell clicking his heels together going, there's no place like home. Oh, there's no place like home. Like, oh yeah, I know. That's a groaner. It's a bad one. Oh, well. We, I know you just talked earlier about the idea of we don't really force the magical perspective anymore. 
But uh, <laughs> man, how how uh how bitching would it be to have like the original ruby slippers for like a ritual? <laughs> like that that's like that's an artifact of great cultural significance, and they are even by their own uh fictional context, they are a magic item. I feel like you could do something very entertaining with those. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think you could probably do some very, very fascinating stuff. Um, I don't know what I would personally be able to do with them, but I know I could come up with something if you gave them to me long enough. I mean, they wouldn't fit my fucking gargantuan feet, so wearing them's right out. <laughs> right. Put them on my hands, do a handstand. One based in dragon filled headline deserves another that is significantly worse. Oh, yeah? What have you got? Someone has returned, haven't they? Who's who's that? A certain uh, Christine Weston Chandler returned oh. to the internet after oh. quite some time. Hey, it's the anniversary, oh. and we talked about them at one point, so we're just checking. God, it. I didn't know that's where we were going with this. <laughs> oh boy, this isn't. This doesn't feel like it's appropriate for news. This isn't. Well, I guess, this isn't I real guess news. <laughs> This isn't political news or anything like that. This isn't even like, this is the news that you don't want to hear. This is the stuff that's getting forced on you where it's like, oh God, Chris Chan's back. Chris, no. Uh, I only ask I've because ar- I haven't seen it. I like, I didn't watch it. I kind of just like, you didn't like, watch oh, that. Happened. Oh. No, I kept oh, well, myself from watching it. There's uh, there's two, two videos as far as I know. Oh so, no. First one is like, the first one is, Basically, just like a "Hey, I'm back," and uh, you know the dimensional merge is definitely taking place, and you should all be very excited and pray to me and Sanchu and everything else like that. One of those, and like I remember, uh, Smoky MC, you know, shout outs to that YouTube channel, described it as it felt like a like Sunday sermon or like Sunday mass for like Chris's religion, <laughs> where it's oh, like, no. yeah, you, you hear some really. Yeah, Chris sings some goofy songs, then gives like the sermon talking about how you need to be positive, love, and light, and all of the evil toxics have been removed. Oh, and how uh, Chris was jailed for your sins. So like much like the, yeah, yeah, for your sins. So there's that. And then like, you know, goofy songs again. That's pretty much, that's pretty much what a mass is, I guess. Wow. But then the second one, Probably because people had people had so many comments and outrage is Chris outright denying that anything happened between them and Barbara. No, just saying that none nothing happened and I was found innocent and released and that this was all a, a ploy and a manipulation by uh, Isabella Janke to try to get me to kill myself and that sort of thing. And the problem is, is that there's like some truth to that, but there's still the, the denial that the denying that something happened when you've already admitted to it happening, not just once, but multiple times. It's a little, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's oogie. It's, it's yucky. It's icky. It's fucked up. It's, yeah, it's the just whole that thing of like, not okay. There was a gent, yeah, there was a genuine part of me that thought that like, okay, and for everybody who has no idea what the hell we're talking about as far as Chris Chan, you're welcome. Don't. Don't, don't, look, don't look this up. Don't do, don't do anything with this. Leave it alone. You'll be so much happier. But for everybody who has already been tainted, I think you'll probably agree that the, the Chris going to prison was probably the best ending we were going to get. And not like, oh, Chris needs to be in prison suffering, but like at the, at the very least, like something that would force Chris to stay off of the internet and possibly get some help was the best option we had where we were at now. The fact that the legal system took one look at Chris, said, nah, just let, let him go, that, you know, we're, we're fucked. The fact that Chris is back on the internet saying, I did nothing wrong. Oh, geez. I was, yeah. This is this is the worst of timelines. <laughs> but uh, it also contributes to that conversation where it's like, you know, everyone makes fun of Chris saying magic ain't real and this and that. But somehow Chris Chris has somehow assaulted 
somehow after all of that, Chris is on the internet saying that they're Jesus still. Yeah. And nothing, nothing bad has happened to them. Yeah. They spent nothing bad what? happened to them. Nothing bad ever is going to happen to them. You are all crazy. None of that happened. I'm Jesus. Sonichu is here with me. Like, motherfucker, you wish you had that level of freedom. That's absolutely yeah. fucking insane. Chris has a criminal record to rival some gangster rappers. And meanwhile, <laughs> like nothing has happened at all. The worst case is like, you know, you spent two years in jail and that was mostly like spent two or not even two years, spent like a year and a half or something like that in jail Yeah, something for something that arguably should have gotten you buried under the prison. <laughs> it's just, it, it is that almost that is that very bizarre thing of like, um, what, maybe there's some, <laughs> maybe there yeah, is maybe. something going on. Yeah. You know, um, we actually, Chris got brought up in our discord. Like yeah, this is the worst episode. We this is the worst episode it. we've done. <laughs> this is the yeah. worst episode we've ever done. This is nothing yeah, but self-serving bad. bullshit, but yeah. we were talking in the discord earlier. I don't remember how Chris got brought up because someone else brought them up. It wasn't me. I swear, but they made the joke about like, what would you even like invoke a Christian for? Like, what would you, what uh, kind of, if you wanted yeah, to do to get magic out of, to, to get, get out, out of legal, legal troubles, yeah. that's what the answer would be. You would invoke Chris to get out of legal trouble because it always, always happens. They never get any real comparable punishment for what they do. And that is all I'm going to say about Chris Chan. I'm done talking. About it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Absolute one more. no, no more. One more goofy uh, headline and we'll go on to the next thing. Uh, former MAGA candidate accuses Taylor Swift of witchcraft. Oh, yeah. I remember seeing this one. Uh, I didn't get any I didn't get any real details. A right wing failed gubernatorial candidate is now setting her sights on a bigger target. Taylor Swift. Candace Taylor, who made an unsuccessful bid for Georgia governor last year on a Jesus guns babies platform. God, I've been out of the South too long. <laughs> Took to social media on Wednesday to accuse the singer of putting some satanic nods in her show and celebrating witchcraft. Taylor's comments on Swift's <laughs> no one thought that phrasing through Taylor's comments on Swift's supposed slide to the dark side were apparently inspired by an Instagram post. The singer made on Wednesday in the post Swift references her era's tour concert film and said she was watching videos of fans dancing and prancing and recreating choreography and creating inside jokes casting spells, getting engaged, and just generally creating the exact type of joyful chaos we're known for. Yeah, okay, yeah, so it's, it's they said casting spells. Well, I mean, mm. I don't know, that one's a little on the nose, I guess, like, if you, what do you mean, that, like, what do you mean that they're, she's, it's a stretch for her to be saying that she said casting spells. What spells do you know that aren't, like, devilly spells? Yeah, I, I, I suppose, I, like, I guess when somebody says casting spells it's like that's i i don't know how else to take that is there a is there a colorful euphemism for that like i mean it's definitely not whatever the satanic crazy nonsense is but it's like well like i don't know that's the problem is like that's more rational than a lot of the takes we get where it'll be like look at the look at the way mickey mouse is holding his hand yeah they, that's they, a freemasonic yeah. symbol Rihanna covers her eye in her music videos because it's like an Illuminati yeah, devil worshiper. You know. Like that's like that. The problem is, is that like when you say casting spells, it's like now the, the point here's what it would go down to is that like Taylor Swift probably doesn't think that witchcraft is real. <laughs> doesn't think that. So like the casting spells thing is like a joke. You know, it's like a, it's a colorful well, mytho, uh, mytho poetic type deal of like you can cast a spell you know like there might even might have even been a literal like acting like like playing like you're casting a spell type deal but yeah like, like that's the difference is that it's like it's very easy to joke about these sorts of things when you don't believe in them and then now it's being read and interpreted by someone who does believe in them very strongly and also only thinks of it as a purely evil satanic thing 
I I've got like I, that's the problem is like this isn't like a a huge crazy thing. It's like that that those two words casting spells is the crux of witchcraft argument. But it's correct. You know, if somebody <laughs> says they're cast, if somebody says if somebody was like, oh yeah, I was out casting spells, and it's like I'm at least gonna be like, what do you mean by that? Can you elaborate? <laughs> Now there's like a a um a a pattern of Taylor Swift <laughs> popping up. You know there was the hypn there was the hypnotism amnesia thing from a couple couple months ago, and then there's you look like Anton Lavey's wife. Something no, going his, on, you know, his daughter. Oh, it's daughter, like a Zena Shrek. Yeah, 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 yeah. But either way, it's just like. There seems to be a lot of weird, and part of it is just like hyper celebrity like that. You get all kinds of weird things associated well, you with know, you. They but did Swift Beyonce a couple of years ago got all the Illuminati stuff. So it makes sense that Taylor yeah. Swift's They've been getting saying that now. stuff for years. Like anybody who's like super successful is like Illuminati, Satanism type stuff. But it's just like, not, I just don't. You said casting spells. What the fuck? <laughs> How am I supposed to? Whoa, 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 shit. I don't know. I don't know how to defend you now. <laughs> Maybe just don't say casting spells next time. Don't cast spells on the MAGA people, mm -hmm. Taylor. We good on the news here? Uh, let me see if there's anything. Hold on. What a goat? A goat in the road? That doesn't sound safe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. Oh uh, wait, no, no. We do have one. We have one more thing. I completely forgot about this. And uh, again, this one's only getting a mention because of like the Taylor Swift one. It is tangentially occult related. Uh, Jada Pinkett Smith put out like a tell all book type thing. Oh, yeah. She said that she... Uh, Tupac Shakur was her soulmate, that they had shared past lives together and that she was a urban nun. And she read from the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran daily and ayahuasca saved her life. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot, man. You read from the the Bhagavad, the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran daily, and then ayahuasca saved your life. I mean, that you, how many different directions are you pulling? I mean, very chaos magic, I guess. But I, I like the two Fox Shakur past life thing. That's pretty cool. Not many people know their past lives. Yeah, we need a list. Like, where <laughs> were you? I'm just wondering if uh, Jada mentioned casting spells at all in this book. <laughs> I feel like this is being uh, willfully misinterpreted to sound like it's a crazy person. <laughs> and if you, if, unless they, unless she explicitly said something like I'm casting a spell and placing a, a, a I tried what they call it a hex. <laughs> unless there's none, unless some of that, then uh, I think that there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying that you were an urban nun and read multiple holy books and ayahuasca saved your life. I mean, that's what I would be doing if I had the option. Co-host, Urban Nun, <laughs> coming this fall. All right, and with that, let's have another little thing from a lovely, lovely listener. <coughs> Hello there, children of the night. My chaos ward, my simple little lads and ladettes, everybody in between. Welcome. Thank you for a fantastic phantasm of a year. May your chaos reign and your magic flow like the spells and books and rituals. You all commence and listerine to your gullet on a daily basis of practice and posture. They're coming to get me now. I don't have long. All I have to say is a great year and great fun to all those who listen. <laughs> Until next time, Chaos Magic News. Man, wasn't that great? Don't we love this? Oh, we, we, we appreciate it. You guys Stop fucking it. <laughs> fucking hate you guys. No, look, God damn it, man. They're never going to do anything for us again. You guys are fucking idiots. Can you just be positive for once in your fucking life? Jesus. No, Christ. I'm doing what I'm, I'm doing like the audio that I think they're saying about us. <laughs> you guys fucking uh, suck. 
Ooh. Uh, <laughs> boo this man. <laughs> okay. So. So we're going to have a nice thing from the listeners right here. Don't make granny bust out latch handler. So we're going to have another nice thing from the listeners right here. Hi, I'm Miel, coming to you live from the astral plane. Hail Eris 23, death to the image, hail the new flesh. Oh, wasn't that beautiful? Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely. Absolutely lovely. All right, so what's up next, co-host? Well, I thought we would take a little stroll down memory lane and revisit some stories from the what's in the news segment of the previous year. Right off the bat, we've got one, a, uh, a, a, little, a little Halloween throwback, episode three. We talked about Pastor Greg Locke. Or oh, Lope. yeah. I'm not sure which. Yeah. I don't, fuck he, him. Uh, I don't care if we get his name right. <laughs> this asshole is one of those fucking blabbering yahoos that wants to talk about how Halloween is going to make your kids crazy Satanist witches and you shouldn't take them trick or treating. And you know what? You should take them. You should take them down to my hallelujah house so that you can see how they're going to burn in hell if they don't accept Jesus, because that's totally not traumatizing and fucked up, right? And that fire in the burning pits of hell will be made out of awesome books. Yeah, they're going to take, they're having, once again, having a mass occult book burning, so they're probably going to be burning, like, fucking baby's first yoga or practical guide to candle magic. You know, no, just, they're going to be fuck. burning like Percy Jackson and the lightning thief. Oh and- yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's going to be even, it's not even going to be that. It's going to be like, Oh yeah, we're burning everybody's copies of Harry Potter. Eat, pray, love to- because pray should be yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it'd it's- be better if it was pray, pray, pray. Yeah. It's, it's absolute fucking drivel. This guy's a fucking dickhead. I don't think that's a controversial opinion. The only people that would uh, disagree with that are his rationally uh, disabled followers <laughs> and just overall this guy like this is such nonsense. But every it's also, year with this shit, yeah, it, I was going to say it's also the only thing that gets this man any attention. <laughs> How many just, fucking that way, book, do you guys go out and buy new books in this fucking town every year? Like, what is this? They ask. They probably ask for donations. But either way, it's well, great. Well, you see, what right it does, before the right before the new school year, we we have the uh, Scholastic Book Fair where we buy all the books, and then come around Halloween, we burn them all. I will. I think that we should send a couple like discount codes to these guys <laughs> for like you know notable occult publishers. That way. They can just, just here, guys, just buy the books from us. I don't care what you do with them after you buy them. It's like, <laughs> shit, burn them. Wipe your ass with them. What? You'll really show me. The only thing you're going to do is make the books I still have that much more valuable. Oh, not even that. I mean, it's like, I'll say, shit, I'm going to sell 500 more copies than I would have. The rest of these are going to get pulped anyway. Way to go. Like, I, I really do love the idea because ultimately, right, if you were burning these, that means you were, but like, you're not breaking in and stealing these out of a warehouse. You're buying them. So everything you're going to burn is something that you bought already or something that was already paid for that you found laying around. And it's like, at, at least from like this shitty capitalist in me of like, make, you know, hustle, let's get this bread. You're, you're just aiding the occult economy. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. Like, you, you imagine like some fucking... <laughs> some middle-aged woman who just really like like the the church community with fucking pastor greg is like her whole fucking life so she's like going into the barnes and noble and asking the girl with the fucking nose piercing and the pentagram earrings being like hey um where what what are what are the books that you like and she's like oh i really like this and like hands her the secret (laughs) and she's like the devil himself just imagine Pastor Greg going, look here, what we have is the Dread Necronomicon. <laughs> we cast it into the fire and we cast in these, you know, six other copies of the Dread Now ne- I don't know why there's, a, I don't know who's committing this to mass print. <laughs> I thought this was locked up in Miskatonic, but uh, yeah. oh, they were awful. having a special. <laughs> oh, man. You joked earlier about casting a hex, and for those of our listeners who might not remember this, we covered a certain curse that a uh, former Detroit Lions player, Bobby Lane, placed on the team. He said, 
I tried what they called a hex, which is just an awesome after idea. they traded yeah, me. Could you imagine that? But on the, can you imagine like an old school football player like sitting in this fucking room with all these candles and shit, like saying some stuff, being like, "Yes, I want you to get back at the Detroit Lions." Oh boy! But last year, around this time, Peyton Manning on his TV show Peyton's Place broke the curse. Using a um, yeah, he used a using beer and rock and salt. Beer and rock salt, yeah, yeah. And uh, since then, drum roll, please. The Lions are uh, five and one this year, and when wow. you search Detroit Lion rank, the first thing that pops up is from five days ago. Detroit Lions are best team in NFL in latest power rankings. And you motherfuckers don't believe in magic. <laughs> oh, man. Seriously. There's another. Any of your skeptical one where... listeners, all of your dads who make fun of you for believing in magic, go to your dad with this story. He, he likes football. He'll have to respect you. <laughs> This will not at all end embarrassingly for you around Thanksgiving hey, dinner. Hey, Thanksgiving is coming up. You better get your ideas to start fights in line, and you could do worse than this. Another notable headline is the Bobby Lane curse is over. The Detroit Lions are legitimate Super Bowl contenders. <laughs> so <laughs> even although sports are naturally, there are a lot of weird superstition tied up in sports. So uh, I'm I'm here for it. I'm. It's good to know that the curse is broken. The drought is over. Detroit, what's up? Detroit. I guess we need to figure out who cursed the Falcons then, right? Um, you don't know nothing about no sports ball. Get out of here. <laughs> I, that was for all the adults in the audience that like sports ball, <laughs> like me, who only got into <laughs> sports ball like a month ago. <laughs> Minor addendum here. The Lions lost a game right after we recorded this, but they are still first in their division. So mm, maybe we shouldn't talk about it. Jinx them. All right. Uh, what else we got for headlines? What else did we talk about this year? I wanted to check in with, and you know, he deserves this. I think that this man is probably the show's punching bag. We have talked about this guy, I think, more than anybody else. And it's weird, right? Because we talk about politicians a lot on this show, mostly because we don't like any of them. So any of the ones that show up, we just have something terrible to say about. But, you know, for everything we said about Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump and Joe Biden, the, uh, the entire Supreme Court, for all the smack we have talked about them, one man, I think, has gotten more of our ire and I really wish we had something good to say about him, but um, he's, he, I think he's washed up. I think we've, I think we've officially used meatball Ron up. Ron, the meatball de sanctimonious DeSantis. It's Ron D San Ron Ronald the Santis. Yeah, we have, we have done like <laughs> every time I, I, he comes know, up, I, we just have, I feel like it's our fault, man. I feel like, I feel like his <laughs> campaign completely falling to shit is our fault. Like, cause he had no chance of winning even before us. Right. But like, he's like so lackluster now. It's like Ron DeSantis. No one cares about Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis. You want to know how, you know, Ron DeSantis is over how? when you Google Ron DeSantis right now. What think of all the, think of all the crazy headlines Ron caught for us. That's, over the last year, right? Fighting with Disneyland, making weird claims about shit, implementing a secret military police. Yeah, trying to get people to register so they could blog about them. So that yeah, you got to register if you want to talk shit about me. Yeah, but and you, you know how you know Ron's done when you type Ron DeSantis, the only thing that pops up is just him and Nikki Haley. Nikki beefing. Haley and yeah, beefing Hamas and blah blah blah. blah, blah. And also just, Rans fighting with also yeah. Rans. Yeah. Like he, he's not sticking out now. No, no, no. nothing. No, he, none of it. it. It's just not doing anything. He's not interesting. He finally got up on stage with all the other people that could say, Hey, I couldn't, I am not Donald Trump and I would like to be a president. And we realized that even out of the, 
the wide breadth of Republican morons that all kind of think exactly the same and just have to be loud to sound different. He's just boring. He's not Mike Pence where we can make jokes about mother. He's not um, Ramaswamy where we can be like, you are actually going to make like a RoboCop if you become president. <laughs> He's not Nikki Haley where we can be like, wow, you're a fucking crazy Warhawk candidate. We haven't had one of you in a while. Shit. <laughs> I forgot that you guys wanted to just blow everything up and you were willing to talk about it at one time. He's not even Chris Christie where we can just laugh and be like, everyone actually hates you. There's nobody on the planet that likes you. It's weird how we can all agree on that. Yeah. Um, one notable headline would be uh, how Ron DeSantis lost the Internet. Talking about uh, attempting right to get right wing social media influencers to do things for him by buttering them up and trying to, you know, really get like a gra the appearance of a grassroots populism sort of thing going. And it just not really working out. Meanwhile, it's just like Donald Trump barely has to do a, a damn thing. Donald Trump just has to exist. And then you have to remind, like, remind people that he's out there. And they're like, yeah, he's probably still got my vote. Probably nothing. It's, and I understand it's still too early to really be making calls. But like, no, 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 this, no. We were, we this were man wrong is about all, the like Donald that. Trump indictment thing. I'm willing to admit that to the listeners. We said we, we ate our hats and everything like we said. but. Unless Donald Trump gets shot in the head or told that he legally cannot run in some sort of weird maneuver that we don't understand, Donald Trump will be the nominee. That's, you know, I, I will stop doing this podcast and replace myself for one episode at least with a Jordan Peterson chat bot if Donald Trump is not the nominee and it's not because he legally can't or he is dead. You want to know the the dumbest, you know, the, the, the dumbest little addition of the DeSantis campaign? Go for it. Um, in March, pro-Trump influence. So I guess we missed this. This was way back in March. Pro-Trump influencers peppered the internet with posts that amplified a rumor that DeSantis had once eaten chocolate pudding with his fingers. No, we did talk about that. Did we talk we talked about pudding fingers? Yeah, we talked God, about it's been pudding. Such a crazy if, year. if we if we didn't talk about pudding fingers, you and I personally talked about pudding fingers because because <laughs> I, I I remember making fun of him a lot for that because it was just like yeah he does he look look at him he looks Ooh. like the kind of guy that eats he's, he's got pudding fingers. Ooh, okay. The best and perhaps only way to counter this thing is to learn to, is to lean into the humor with it. This is called meme magic. The irony is the more you try to stomp it out, the more it becomes a problem. So right there, we're what? God damn. It's a uh, man. It's, it's 20, it's 2011 already. <laughs> it's 2011. Once again, we're talking about meme magic in relation to presidential campaigns. Fuck. All right. And with that, we'll have another break to hear from our lovely, lovely listeners. Are you ready to unlock the secrets of the universe? To dive into the wisdom of the ages with the timeless classic, The Cabalion by Three Initiates. This foundational text of Western occultism reveals the ancient hermetic teachings that have influenced philosophers, scientists, and thinkers for centuries. Discover the principles of mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and gender. These universal laws can transform your life, helping you manifest your desires, find a balance, and gain true insight. Whether you're a true seeker of knowledge or just mildly curious about the mysteries of the universe, the Kabbalion is your guide. Get your copy today and embark on a journey of self-discovery and enlightenment. The Kabbalion, a timeless treasure for those who seek the keys to a life filled with purpose and wisdom. Available now at your local bookstore or online. Don't miss your chance to unlock the secrets of the universe. Get the Kabbalion today. Hey, wasn't that great, listeners? 
Yeah, wasn't that wonderful? Uh, we're so happy to have those. Well, so... Um, In fact, it's so good, we're going to have another one right here. Reverse my buttocks, Sergeant Major. Oh, excellent, excellent. Wasn't that amazing, folks? God, I, Thank you I so loved much. that one so much. I, man, that was so great that I think... And you know what? Maybe, uh, maybe we're being a little extra right now, but how about another one right here? I hope I have this many. I think I have this many. What about, uh, what about now? No, not again. If I had a nose full of nickel, I know just what I would do. For all of the kind of things that you've done for me, I would sneeze all my nickels at you. All right, all right, all right. God, we're right. not going to have any for the no end more of the episode. Of the... Calm down. <laughs> okay. So, the last but what thing we about wanted to do. this? No. no. Oh, gee, I really like that CMN podcast. Yeah. I think that one was just you. Unlikely. I hate this show. So, to wrap up this week, we wanted to go over the first episode, little, basically, and see what... Just a what, little, little stroll down memory lane, really looking yeah. back at where we started and where we are now. Where are we right now? I, <laughs> at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Scraping for content. <laughs> but no, it is it is interesting to think where we, you know, we, we started off pretty chill. Like, you know, the first episode is literally just us talking about why you should care about chaos magic and then do you, do you have any you any new insight as to why you should care about chaos magic because i think we both kind of agreed at the very beginning of this and it's been a constant thing that we've brought up is that at this point chaos magic is important because it's still like the leading edge of occultism because nothing has supplanted it yet you still feel that way uh i still stand by that assessment yeah chaos magic is and uh until something unseats it, it's going to be the reigning champ. It's so ingrained in modern occult thinking that you end up with people that know nothing about chaos magic that are doing chaos magic. And it's just how it is. I think that in a, in a weird way that there's just, unless there's something that really overhauls our understanding of consciousness of of uh, or maybe even the underlying basics of how our reality functions in the same way that like chaos theory did in physics and quantum mechanics did in physics, unless something like that happens, I don't know if we are going to get that. I don't know if there's anywhere else to go. Yeah, there's um, there's a lot of places I think we can still go in occultism. I try to have a very wide open horizon to the new possibilities that are on there that are out there, but it is hard to see beyond chaos magic, especially now that it's like, you know, been what 50 years of chaos magic. Yeah. Yeah. 50 years, yeah, 50 years. And there's not like, and, and chaos magic has changed since then. You know, I think you and I even talk about like, you know, the way we view chaos magic isn't, it's not confined, even though we're very big on trying to like get back to the sort of Carol and Sherwin, um, origins of chaos magic a lot. We know that it, it's very much not contained to that by any stretch of the imagination, right? Absolutely not. Right. So I, I think as it as it stands now, it's it's hard to see it going anywhere. But I I hope it does. I hope I can be a part of it, even. But but there's always int- there's still even if you even if you aren't slaying the the grand chaos dragon to to re to bring about the new age of, of magical thought. There's still plenty of innovation and, and experimentation and new frontiers to explore with magic. I mean, shit, look at everything that people are doing with AI. Even if you don't like AI, people are doing interesting stuff. with it. Oh yeah. And that's just one thing. You know, that's just one thing right off the top. There's always going to be new territory. There's always going to be new a- avenues to explore. And yeah. I guess in another way too, it's like, if your goal is to have a practice that is effective and conducive to getting you what you want in the world, who cares if you're innovating? Is it working? Well put. Well put. You know what's not well put? What? This segue. 
so Lizzo, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, man. It, it sucks Holy because fuck, like, right? I, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, we okay. ju- I, the question we had was, is Lizzo cursed? And then it's like, shit. No, yeah, Lizzo's definitely cursed. Maybe, she was, that maybe explains all of her. She's possessed. You shouldn't have touched that fucking crystal, uh, crystal flute, huh? God damn, Lizzo. What happened, baby? Oh, girl, what oh, is you man. doing? Baby girl, what is you doing? Oh. Yeah, that's shit. Oh, man, it's- that really fucking sucks. It's like, and granted, like, okay, for anyone who has already forgotten, Lizzo performed with a crystal flute that, long to james madison and that was one of the first headlines we ever talked about and we made a lot of like jokes like is she cursed is the ghost of james madison haunting her and this that and the other and it was like really goofy because at the time lizzo was just like putting out bangers and being a great performer and seeming like like a really lovely lady and then like <laughs> of course because someone's famous and seems great that means they did something <laughs> terrible and there's these horrible allegations that came out earlier this year they're just all it's all sorts of fucked up shit where it's like she she body shamed her dancers and she peer pressured them into doing shit that they weren't comfortable with weird sexual things going on bringing them to like strip clubs stuff and with stuff. a banana somewhat a banana yeah which is totally out there she's been she's been named in a lawsuit and there's all sorts of stuff and it just sucks it just really sucks to think that she would do that to people it's just everybody that works in and i don't i'm not sure what like the the musical entertainment industry i guess whatever because these were like backing dancers and stuff really sucks because it's hard work and you're really underappreciated and you don't make as nearly as much as you think and then like on top of that somebody with like more money and clout than you'll probably ever have is like fucking with you someone who's i mean let's let's call it how it is like someone who gets a lot of press and a lot of their image is based around like body positivity right you know she's she's a big girl and she's you know and like she's they're always talking about like oh look she can like break it down dancing and you know has the flute and everything and she's beautiful and she's smart and she writes great songs you know, like she's against all the stereotypes of being like a fat slob. And she's like over there, like going to the dancers and like swatting their bellies with a towel and shit being like, come on, suck it in fat. Yeah. It's just, like, it's fucked up. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's brutal. And it's like, why the fuck? Like, why? Like how, it's cause people how suck. hard is it to not? Yeah. How hard is it to not fucking do that to people? You know what I mean? It's like, just think about it like this. Like the next time you could do anything, you could not. Yeah. Yeah, for real. It's like, you should just not, maybe, you know? And it's like, yeah, these are all alleged. These are all allegations. But I, at, at the very least, there's enough credibility to uh, to have this out there from more than just, like, the rumor mill, you know? And I don't know where the lawsuit's going to go with this either, but it's it's probably just going to be somebody's going to get some hush money and everybody's going to move on, and then it's going to... St- Oh, yeah. Shit like this yeah. will happen again. Well, well, the thing is, like most of us, even now, I'm sure plenty of people have forgotten about the Lizzo thing anyway. The only reason it's yeah. really relevant to us is because we're going over the whole episode. And we're like, hey, we talked about Lizzo. What's the last thing that Lizzo did? Oh, oh it's really <laughs> bad shit. Yeah. Bad people stuff. Hey, you know what else is bad people stuff? What? Um, the entire concept of uh, cheese magic. It's neat because the first episode doesn't have the delineations nearly as well between segments because we just talk about the cheese magic thing as like it's a headline, but it's not news. It was like a, you know, it's like an editorial thing about that's cheese like magic. the origin of that's the origin of the culture piece, really. Like, because oh, yeah. what we yeah. did, what we did with we we actually we did a lot more news like read throughs. Like, we still do them, mm-hmm. but we did a lot more of them in the early days just to try to really get into some weird topics and stuff. So it, it kind of made sense, but you're right. It wasn't actually news. That really was, like, the first magic, like, that was the first time we, like, looked at an article and gave it hell. But it, that one wasn't really giving it hell. That was actually being very nice and positive. What happened to us? We're nice and positive. We're talking about how you shouldn't hit people in the belly with a towel. <laughs> Not doing that is pretty nice. Um, well, are you going to be nice when we talk about the next part of that episode? What about the cheese magic thing? Well, no, because I don't think we have any. I don't have any updates on cheese magic because it wasn't actually news. <laughs> so it can't really have did like you, an update. 
why don't you have why have you not done cheese magic that's that's a real question because i'm getting tummy aches <laughs> make my stomach hurt <laughs> actually listeners listeners i want you to think back to episode one god and uh, if anybody i really hope that people don't start at episode one when they start listening to us <laughs> we're gonna you know <laughs> hey, i i i have an idea Let's start yeah. backdating all the episodes. <laughs> we like, need to just do like a recommended like, like negative 20. <laughs> and then we'll have an episode zero, zero that says, if you listen to any of the episodes before this, we, we do not stand by any of those statements. This is the danger zone. <laughs> CMN danger zone. <laughs> Everything. Don't listen past this point. <laughs> If you oh, love man. Mr. Uh, Carter, don't listen. <laughs> Maybe we should have like a recommended, like a, like a recommended list of like, Hey, if you wanted to start listening to the podcast, you should start with episodes like, you know, seven, 12, <laughs> that sort of thing. And then start going, don't listen to episodes like one through five, pretty much. But listeners, if you have been listening to the start, remember what I told you, you might be the best cheese magician out there and you don't even know it yet. Go grab that good that go grab I almost said Gutenberg, but that's a press. <laughs> go grab that Gouda. And see what happens. You never know. You like you never know. You just you do an invocation to the to the Parmesan. Tell you hard what, cheese I, I for will, hard times. <laughs> um tell you what, listeners, because I'll have to edit this episode later anyway. I will go do some cheese magic and I'll tell you how it goes. Right here. <laughs> Didn't do it. It was bad. I'm sure it was. I'm pretty sure it was. It terrible. was real bad. It was awful. My stomach hurts. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the last part of that episode was a review of a certain book that you had only gotten a chapter into. You remember that book? Uh, what? What? Mm. You d you don't remember the book you read? <laughs> this is the only book you've by? read in the last like five years. Who, who's it by? Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison does comic books. <laughs> This isn't making. I don't. I, I think I'd remember if they did a book. They did. It was called Luda. Not ringing any bells. You don't remember this at all. Who who's in it? Um, what's oh it God. about? Did you read it? No. You you read me like the first couple pages. I remember how it goes. No, Johnny. <laughs> no, I remember. Wait, 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 wait. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. How? What What did you think? Did you read the book? Yeah, I read the book. I was there. <laughs> I seen it. I did it. So imagine using a using a theater, right? And there's this broad, like putting on her makeup in a mirror, and she's soliloquizing, and she's like, "I don't know where things come from. I don't know where things go. Oh, why the why the apple fall on Newton? Why why did uh, the <laughs> sitting bull go falling down? It's like I don't know." That's your job. I remember. I remember everything. Bye, Johnny. No, nah, I, I said I wanted to be in more episodes. <laughs> no, Johnny, we've talked this about is this. Ridiculous. There's I'm a reason no one, no one likes you, Johnny. Show. Everybody likes Johnny. Francis. I like you, Johnny. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> oh, God. We can't. You, you can't encourage John. You can't encourage Johnny Francis, man. He's got. He's. Uh, Oh God! Does you, oh, man? I don't even want to do this show anymore. Well, thanks to CMN special contributor Johnny Francis, I do in fact remember the book we were discussing in episode one was Grant Morrison's debut novel *Luda*, a tale about a drag queen performer and secret magic. <laughs> <laughs> Big spooky woo woo drag queen performer of the glamour. Oh man, Lucy LeBang is a, a <laughs> Lucy LeBang is a drag queen cross dresser performer, whatever word you'd want to use for it. That uh, is also a witch of a particular type of magic realism sort of thing of glamour. The idea of by infusing mundane reality with a sort of a uh, hyper aesthetic presentation, you can sort of slip the bonds of reality and create things that are more real than real type thing. 
it's it's interesting. It's not. I I wouldn't look at this book when I first picked it up. I thought that there was going to be a real magical system that you could sort of crib. There's just more of like there's interesting ideas about magic, and I think it goes with Morrison's ever evolving ideas about magic that oddly enough seem to get closer and closer to Alan Moore's beliefs that imaginary faculty of magic, the image maker and how that the artist is the modern magician, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's they're they're I, they're both getting very heavy into the sort of creative act being magic and specifically in the sort of thought idea space. But Morrison definitely taking a step back from the heyday of the invisibles when it was like, yeah, reality is just like, um, as a, is an info matrix that you can hack the code of and get things that you want. <laughs> used to be, used to be pretty balls to the wall about how effective magic was and not just not so much anymore, which is fine. I I'll say that, uh, I read the first chapter that we didn't, that we did in the first episode. And I got maybe about halfway through after that. And then I put this book down for about eight months. <laughs> I didn't finish this book. I, I did not finish this book till shoot. I can't even remember. It doesn't matter. I finished this earlier this year, a couple months ago, probably after I put it down for a, a hot minute. And I base I didn't reread everything, but I did have to sort of skim through and remind myself, oh yeah, and then this happened and this happened. Okay, now I can finish reading it. I had a lot of trash to talk about it in the beginning. And uh, I, I really haven't warmed up to this book. I wish I, I want to like it. I want to like this book. Well, I, I want say, to like you, this book. You do bring it up. You brought it up in a later episode saying that it got better. It, it got better, but then it like it. But then it also is still bad. It gets worse. It gets good and then it's bad. Then it gets good and then it's bad. And it's like... I just don't, I don't know who this book is for. I really don't. This book is a, like, and it, it so much, the, it has huge pacing issues and it has, its ending is simultaneously like, oh shit, that's so, that is such a great climax. And then like the, the last half chapter or whatever, you know, last couple paragraphs are just like trying to wrap things up and it's just wrapping it up in the the shit way that only Grant Morrison can pull off. <laughs> it's just what, like, like, I'm just like the end of the Invisibles, be, like a non-ending? Like exactly that. Oh. Just this unearned attempt at like high, high-minded ideas about reality and stuff like, and it's just not, I, I. Not good, is it? It's not. It's just, it just misses the mark with me so many ways. There's great ideas in this book. Uh, there's also like one of the most obvious fucking twists that you're ever going to see coming ever, ever. Listeners, like if, you, if you don't want it spoiled right now, skip to insert time here. Yeah, I'm look, okay. You want me to spoil it for you? Cause I'll tell you. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Right. Look, okay. Lucy LeBang takes on a protege named Luda. Luda is also a cross-dresser. Uh, her past is shrouded in mystery and blah, blah, blah. But you know for a fact that Luda doesn't know who her parents are, like her birth parents. And then oh. it, Lucy LeBang finds out that his ex-wife was pregnant and supposedly got an abortion. But if you have two brain cells that are half firing that day, you're going to put it together that shocker luda is actually lucy lebang's child and that they were that the abortion didn't happen and the baby got sent off somewhere and blah 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 and oh but the problem is is that the two the two of them don't do anything with that they don't care it's like luda isn't like bitter about the, i'm not even sure if, I'm, i can't even tell if luda actually knows and then lucy is definitely like broken up about it but doesn't have any qualms about murdering Luda at the end. There, there's the other spoiler. <laughs> Lucy kill Lucy kills Luda. It, it's not like he does it like in a premeditated malice sort of thing. It's like just very clear that it's like if I don't kill you, you are going to murder me, and it's going to be done. You know that sort of thing. Um, and don't get me wrong, the climax 
even if it's already been spoiled for you, the climax of how Lucy does it is banging. Like that is a great act. Like props to Morrison for really getting a great action scene down away from the visual medium because that's difficult. It's so much easier to just type on a script and then they punch the Joker in the face and then karate chop. <laughs> like that's it says, easy bam, and it's hard in big letters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but so yeah, bam. yeah, writing writing action scenes is a lot harder, especially for someone that doesn't have a whole lot of experience not writing in the visual medium. Yeah, yeah. So there's as a first attempt at a novel, this is not terrible. I don't abs I didn't absolutely I finished it, you know. But there's just so many missteps here. And like I said, that twist to me felt so fucking obvious just did not care for it at all and the the ending like the like the last two paragraphs or something like that is just it's just not uh, you know like i i almost am tempted to read it in the same way that we like made fun of the the opening paragraphs <laughs> but the problem being that like you'd have to, it's not going to make sense because you haven't read the entire book Although there's also like a cheeky sort of thing where here, I'll, I'll read this part. This is like the last two lines. Wait, wait, hang on. I'll, I'll put the, I'll put the music in from last time. Put to the really exact bring it same circle. music. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Yep, here we go. In the event I failed to say enough or if instead it's all too much, I've left a three word kiss off for the impatient ones who preferred to cut to the end. The abridged version, the t-shirt slogan I promised written large on glass and swishy Mon Rouge cursive across the flat reflective faces. Where is it coming from? This voice in your heads all together. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and others, she's behind you. So there's like that, that I just, I do got it. Like, I don't know. I just, you know, like it just doesn't, it probably doesn't make much sense in context because you haven't read the rest of the book, but there is something like no, 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 doing no, a no. thing. Listeners, go to episode one these- and look for that part. Go to the first episode, find where we were reading it, and then go listen to that bit again. They, that is the same character, and you can tell just from reading it, and that's why this novel is not good. Yeah. Again, I um, haven't read it. I, I can't there's... really say anything, but it's like I, I can't imagine having read the the part that we did in the first episode and that and any part of this I'll, makes I'll you I'll say this. The it. Lucy LeBang character is like an awful human being for, for about 90% of the book. And that's definitely the point is that, Le, is that Lucy sucks. This book feels like there's a lot of ideas that are just incomplete. I don't know. I just, I, I think that this is a, this isn't like career ending. This isn't like, oh, never write another novel again. It makes me think like the next book that Grant writes is going to be better. <laughs> well, like you said, it's a, it, as a first novel, it's probably not the worst thing ever, honestly. I, but I also think that maybe, and this is going to suck given where, <laughs> given <laughs> things we w- said we wanted to talk about in the future is that like, I think a lot of Grant Morrison's writing has like the spell has worn off on me, you know? Yeah. When you're young and you also don't know, nearly as enough about magic and stuff like that. A lot of more since ideas seem really like edgy and wild and out there. And then you like, I guess as you get, you get more in the know and it's like, it's not that his writing gets worse, but a lot of the mystique wears off. Well, it's like, it's like anything. If you don't know a whole lot of music, a lot of people you like early on won't hold up to the, the people that you learn about as you grow musically same thing with novels if the more novels you read the more books you read in general you'll have a different sort of appreciation for the other ones you have read and more makes the same way i am really curious not like uh oh listeners please go buy this book and read it but if anybody has i i really want to hear other people's opinions this this hasn't made tremendous amount of waves even among people that are like Grant Morrison fans, I don't think. And I just, I wanted to like it. I wanted, I really, really wanted to like this book. And the, I guess the fact that I was able to put it down for months and just not touch it was really all I needed to know was that I wasn't in this book. If anybody can explain the ending to me in a way that makes me think it doesn't suck, I'd love to hear it. (laughs) Because right now it just seems like, uh, it seems like, 
the very thin veneer that the idea that Lucy is like recording the story of what happened and then is possibly an unreliable narrator also possibly burns down the theater and kills people and does all this shit and then is just gone. And then the, there's also the implication that there's no way that this recording actually exists. So maybe it's like Luda being Lucy. I don't know. Either way, it's just like, it sucks. <laughs> it's not done very well. It's not very good, is it? As far as endings that don't make any sense and kind of turn into a big anticlimax, here's more uh, listener stuff. Hey, Kennedy, getting back to you about that conversation we had over co-host and this whole Minotaur thing you were worried was getting kind of weird. It seems like it depends on what part of the Minotaur mythos a person is interested in, which really determines whether it's bestiality or just yiffing. And since it seems to be the Minotaur itself he's preoccupied with and not the means of conception, it's probably not random farms he's been sneaking off to while, and I quote, working so much. There isn't really a standard for the female version of a minotaur since the whole tar part is inherently male, so this might be some repressed homoerotic impulse, or it might just be you know, some kind of male intuition thing. But that depends completely on whether or not it's the external idea of the bull man or the uh, <laughs> internal idea of a bull man sounds bad, but I, I don't mean it in a gay way. And not that there's anything wrong with getting topped by a bull man if that's what someone's into. I'm not judging. Uh, getting off topic, I'm trying to suggest it's like the invoking of the Minotaur as an archetypal energy, right? And channeling that archetype through his actions, in which case it's probably a fursona. He's the bull man doing the topping in that case instead of being topped by the bull fursona. Not that we know it's a sex thing, but it is a minotaur, and the subtext around that sometimes skews erotic. The legend says the young people were being sent as a sacrifice to the minotaur, but it's usually stated like he's devouring them, not sating his sexual appetites with them. It's super weird that they'd only be feeding him yearly, though. Does he have, like, a really small appetite? It'd be some very efficient use of calories for something that big and muscular. There's this theory that predators get their plant-based nutrients from eating the stomachs of their herbivore prey, so I guess if the Minotaur is eating well-fed young people from Athens, then maybe that works out all right, but I'd assume he'd be pretty nutrient deficient as a result of that. And he's enough part bull that he'd probably be an herbivore too, wouldn't he? Also, wasn't the labyrinth underground? So he's not getting his vitamin D that way. Unless the sex theory is correct, in which case, I mean, there's some D going around. The infrequent schedule lends credence to the sex theory, too, and maybe food was a more frequent offering. Anyway, it might not be a furry thing so much as just, like, an extremely niche branch of spirit work for engaging with something animalistic, but still recognizable as human. I'm not clear on whether using an axe as a weapon is a modern invention. Apparently, Rick Riordan had him wielding a double-headed axe, and I haven't read those books, but that's what always comes to my mind, too, and I'm not sure why. But it's interesting because there's an association between minotaurs and male sexuality, but axes are considered a feminine weapon, as, you know, opposed to swords, which for obvious phallic reasons— and in antiquity, it was only goddesses depicted wielding axes, not gods. This might be a massive reach, of course, but if this imagery originated among people who understood their associative symbolism, then it's totally possible this was a way of acknowledging sexual expression, both masculine and feminine, through one terrifying, powerful, and devouring monster. Makes you think. So, hey, also worth bringing it up because it might make a difference. Is it the version of the Minotaur which has the bull's head that co-host is so preoccupied with? Or is it the version that's more like a bull-based centaur? The former is a creature with supernatural strength, but none of the human intellect by which to control it, which implies there's an impulsivity issue at work and almost definitely means this is a yif thing. If it's the bull centaur, then the man's head and upper body suggests there's still an ability to reason, but working in concert with a distinctly animal side. 
Centaurs are in the same category as vampires and werewolves, though. Bullheaded minotaurs get the double category of mythic and furry. Centaurs are simultaneously too human and too horse, or bull, to be furries. The animal part is too animal, and the human part is too human. So it's, well, I guess bestiality where you can communicate consent, which is not a thought I've had before. You're welcome. The Minotaur hits all the furry points, though, animal characteristics on a basically human figure. The next time you decide to have a delicate conversation with him about this Minotaur thing, maybe verify if it's the clearly mythic kind or if it's the fursona kind. Also, regardless of whatever answer you get, please pass along that I'd love to hear about this because I am fucking stymied with the story I'm working on. I could really use someone with his insights to spitball ideas with and punch up the draft. I really think the available Minotaur fiction options are missing something, but the archetypal spirit of the Minotaur isn't answering my calls. Thanks, sweetie. I'll talk to you later. Fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Warms the heart, doesn't it? It does. It really does. Well, I guess on that note, all we have left is the palate cleanser. It's a shame. I almost don't want this reverie to end. I feel like next episode, we're going to have to work a lot harder because we're not just going to be talking about ourselves the whole time. Yeah, this was truly a self-indulgent little uh, little walkabout. And if you, you made it all the way through, God bless you. God bless you. So we get to ask the most self-indulgent question we usually ask. How goes the work? Well, I've got some interesting stuff that's been happening since I started the, uh, the ritual section. And I don't want to get my hopes up, but I think I said that I, I thought it was going to go a little bit faster than the others. When it seems like that is actually holding true, I'm getting. And maybe it is because, like I said, the ritual, it opens you up to doing a lot more things. You don't feel nearly as restricted, but I'm getting, I'm getting interesting results at a pretty quick rate. I had some stuff that honestly made me go a little, Oh shit, I forgot this was for real. <laughs> so that was, that's cool. I'm still trying to wrap my head around some of it. Um, of all people, it's made me regain an appreciation for Carl Jung, which, uh, really sucks. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> give that guy anything, but yeah, like he's you, doing Jung. great. You know, he's definitely got some things that um, upon reexamination made me uh, sort of come back around. I'm like, shit, I didn't want to give it to you, but hey, man, maybe you knew a thing or two about a thing or two. And I never was like, oh, Jung doesn't know shit about shit, but yeah, I, I was to... a lot harder on Jung than you were, but you and I were both very, very critical of him for a while. And, um, it's, and good it's probably to... because we used to like him so much, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, we were. So now that the pendulum is swinging back towards the center. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Abraxas is what I'll say there. Abraxas, Abraxas, Abraxas. So how are things going on your end? Oh, man. Um, my altar is bare except for a cup and a bread pentacle. I'm Bro, waiting. You're getting this bread? I'm getting this bread. Oh, shit. It's man, like a Eucharist grinded. cake. But <laughs> it's sitting there empty waiting for it's what moldy. needs to appear. <laughs> <laughs> mold is gonna appear <laughs> <laughs> oh shit um but yeah i'm i'm reading a lot lot a lot of phenomenology stuff and a lot of things on the um the phenomena of perception because i'm hoping when i get everything together like i want i'm gonna have a very convincing and interesting take on magic that can be useful for something, but I want to make sure I have all the pieces of it together because it's a weird little box. And like I said, it, it, it might be something that gets people to scratch their heads and say, huh, this is fascinating, but I want to make sure I got all my ducks in a row on it. And the hardest part of it is because it's a bunch of like high minded philosophy stuff that I'm like trying to get people to understand might be important to their magical practice. So that's going to be the challenging part. How does this square with your idea of uh, the translate man must translate himself into an entire grimoire? Oh Yeah. Man must make a grimoire. You know, man must be able to make a grimoire in his own image. Like God made man and such. Well, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting like at. That's, yeah. You feel no, like that's when exact, you find that's, the, 
Yeah. This is what I've been doing with my magic for like the last, I don't know, like six years at least. Like this is what I'm doing. I'm just trying to make sure I have the proper language and understanding to say what's happening. It's a weird thing, right? Because it's like if I could if I could explain this to you in any other terms, I would. But I don't think I can. Like it's this jargon, this philosophical jargon that I've absorbed through all this bullshit is the only way I can actually describe what I think is happening here. And that goes to my whole bag that I've ratted on a million fucking times now about like the Cartesian underpinning of chaos magic and the sort of metaphysical assumptions and yada, 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 like all of that stuff, just the stuff that I've told these people that are listening to the show a billion times already. I just got to make sure that I'm saying it in a way that other people are actually going to understand because you guys are willing to listen to 28 episodes of me babbling about nonsense in between dick jokes. These are going to be people that I have to be able to convince in like 10 pages. Oh yeah, absolutely. As far as my actual practice stuff, I'm still just doing the stuff I always do. It's like, I don't, I don't have a big project to work on. I'm just, I'm waiting for whatever the next big working is. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, consistency. I think I even talked about that where it's like just having a, and and I've just gone through a very, a, a very, very busy, not a, not like a rough, patch or like a hard spot just a really busy busy period as far as work two months without a day off kind of shit not that i'm complaining but it it is that reminder especially when you don't when you have like barely any leisure time because you're just working 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 and then as soon as you're off like i gotta try to maintain my life you know just the essentials right yeah (laughs) making sure that i got clean draws making sure i wash my ass making sure the cat gets fed Yeah, exactly. When you have that, you know, just the, it really does hammer into you that cons- that consistency is the key. And then also that like the five minutes of something is better than nothing. Right. Exactly. If all you can get, if all I can get is 10 minutes at my altar and I have, you know, I, I'm fortunate. I've got multiple altars in my house. I've got right. one right by my bed so I can yeah. just wake up. If and all go- you can get is like 20 minutes of yoga at work, that's better than doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's the same thing as like working out. Yeah. Which is yeah. another reason why you're all bad magicians because you're not working out except our discord because <laughs> our discord's working out. They're they're We're real proud of them. You guys are feeling the burn. I'm going to, I'm yeah. going to have another yeah. drink. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me light a cigarette. <laughs> can I put more cheese on this, please? Can I get a can I get a bacon cheddar cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> so and wash it down with a with a rum and coke. Well, one year down. Get any closing thoughts? You know, I think uh I think the real magic was the podcast we made along the way. Nah, that's lame. Don't use that one. Uh, realize, realize, real lies. No, 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 that isn't it. Um, going in the microwave, <laughs> going in the microwave. Oh, wait, I got, I, I got it. I got it. I got it. Microwave, microwave, <laughs> microwave, microwave. Sorry. Elon. What have you got? Elon, bro. <laughs> Elon, get at me. Macrowave. <laughs> uh, no, you know, you know what I my closing uh, thoughts are. I think. What? Um, this has been Chaos Magic News, the only podcast that is gonna be here next year with significantly more followers, or in a nuclear holocaust. Literally one or the other. All right. No, in your between. call, big government. <laughs> no, it's your call, listeners. If you don't hit that follow button, <laughs> it's gonna happen. <laughs> Choose oh, the good ending. <laughs> and if you want the good oh. ending, you can find us if you at would... 
chaosmagicnews.com where we have articles, links to the pod, all the things you could ever possibly want from us. We are on social media at Chaos Magic News. We're on Instagram, Facebook, X, Threads, TikTok even. TikTok. Yeah, all those wonderful things. Blue Sky soon. Oh, yeah, Blue Sky, if you know what that is. I have no clue what the fuck that is. And we're at Chaos Magic News on all those. You can find all the dank memes and clips of the episodes you could ever want. As we mentioned a billion times already, and you've seen because we included them in this episode because they're our favorite, we have a Discord if you want to come join and talk to us and have a ball. And maybe by the time next year comes around, you'll have better submissions than the ones that we got this year. Like this one. It's called McDonald's. A bursting decadent, a wither of parishions, twists all our hearts collectively, but its sweetness can win, and it can, that I'll be here tomorrow to high five you yesterday, my friend. Peace. Adventure Time, Season 2, Episode 9. It's way too late in the episode to have done that. And on that note, I will be taking the last word. Thanks for one year, guys. Thanks, everybody. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Like, Johnny Francis is a recurring character, but even when we came up with him, we acknowledged he's like, like, he's a, he's fictional. So Johnny Francis has very, like, Johnny Francis actually crossed the threshold from fictional character to, like, real person as far as the show is concerned. I mean, as far as my life's concerned, like Johnny Francis lives in my head now. Mm, I'm mm. just like going through my day to day life, and then Johnny's Francis and then is there. Johnny's just pop there. Up. Yeah, Johnny's voice just not comes into my head, and he's like, "Grab the gun, <laughs> grab the what? office's what? gun." <laughs> I don't know. That's your job. <laughs> That's your Why job would I do to that? grab that gun. <laughs> <laughs>